Welcome back. Welcome back. We're looking today at uh, Halloween. Halloween. Well, Halloween is one of these things that uh, many Christians, many religious people are out doing Halloween this time of year. But uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are not doing Halloween. And not all Christians do it. Some uh, do not get involved in Halloween. And we're going to take a look at uh, why. Now if you see the steam coming beside me, it's because it's coming out of this cup. <laughs> you can get these cups uh, on our store below. They're really good cups. They really hold the heat in good. Just making myself a tea. Okay, well we're going to get right at it. Let's look at Halloween. Here's the uh, Jehovah's Witness website. <clears throat> Is Halloween really for Christians? Find out. And of course we get into all the ugly stuff about Halloween, the truth about it, you know, how it's celebrated and and other things. They explain where it comes from. Um, they focus really on the witches and stuff like that, but we're going to talk about this in a bit. It's not that scary. Although Halloween has been viewed <clears throat> as American holidays, they say many newcomers, however, are unaware of the pagan origins. Now, just so i um, get on the screen here, just, just so everyone knows, the wedding ring has a pagan origin. Showers, baby showers, best men, all kinds of things. The, the wedding festival, the uh, tying of the hands, you know, that's a Celtic pagan tradition. That's where the wedding ring kind of, you know, it all came from the Romans, the Celts. The Romans took over the Celts. Now, I'm going to show you something here. Uh, my hat is from Ireland <laughs> and you can't get that in the store but that's that's where the uh, Celts are from Ireland and uh, they uh, this time of the year they believe that uh, the veil was uh, lighter and uh, it was time of year in the winter when a lot of people died because of the cold weather so they uh, were dealing with death. How do they deal with death? So they were giving uh, gifts to ward off any bad spirits. And that's kind of where it all started. The uh, Halloween uh, came into the Romans. The Romans conquered the Celts and they introduced the All Saints Day. They had another holiday in around the same time of year, uh, the Romans. So what do we do today with Halloween? Well, Halloween today is in the late 1800s. There was a move in America to mold Halloween into a holiday, more about community and neighborly, getting togethers, getting togethers, than about ghosts, pranks, and witchcraft. And at the turn of the century, Halloween parties for both children and adults became the most common way to celebrate the day. And the parties focused on games, foods, and the seasons and fest. Uh, festive costumes. So uh, parents were encouraged by newspaper community leaders to take anything frightening out of Halloween celebrations because of these efforts Halloween lost most of its superstition and religious overtones by the beginning of the 20th century. So we'll just take you back to the uh, Jehovah's Witness picture here and uh, it's that's what it displays. It displays some kids, uh, families involved, they're all going out Halloweening and dressing up. So we're going to take a look at this. Um, what, how, how, what benefits? And that, that was the thumbnail. Benefits. What kind of benefits do we have with Halloween today? Is there some benefits? So that's what we're going to take a look at. And then we'll take a look at uh, a, a couple of scriptures to see what the Bible says about Halloween. Okay, so let's look at the psychology of Halloween. Um, Halloween, and I'll, I'll, I'll pin these articles. Now, Halloween also gives us the opportunity. I'll blow this up if I can. There it is. So, Halloween also gives us the opportunity to wear what we can't wear and yet be socially accepted. Because being socially accepted and dressing as we please without being judged is something we strive for in our daily lives. It is not a stretch to say that Halloween is psychologically beneficial to us in this regard. And furthermore, dressing up 
as our fears for Halloween allows us to confront them while also revealing that we possess all of the traits we fear and shame in our human side. So what are some of the costumes? Uh, I'll get off the screen here. There's a lot of different costumes that uh, people dress up and uh, this is a time that they can be someone that they admire maybe superman or something like that you know uh here's some kids with uh, butterflies little butterflies maybe she wants to be a fairy you know here's kind of a kind of an actor looking person over here you can be like that these ones here are what are they walking dead i'm not sure so you can be whatever you want to be. Halloween allows you to dress up. Look at these little kids. They're dressing up like superstars. And this one's like uh, the Sesame Street. The little, you know, the guy in the garbage can. <laughs> Oscar, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Halloween gives you, gives kids a chance to be creative. And, and how many smiles did you see on the children's faces? So that's that's one of the things that Halloween gives you. Now, let's look at a little bit more of the psychology behind Halloween. Now, even if Halloween is associated with the issues that comprise of our fears, it has the potential to go beyond simply feeding our fears. It can even open the door to play and imagination. And approaching objects or elements that are avoided in daily life due to fears for entertainment purposes, and even making fun of fears in this way, can help children's imagination and creativity in a healthy way. So for a lot of us ex-Jehovah's Witnesses um, that, uh, th that we come out, we're actually coming out of a box. And we're coming out, coming out of this box, we're poking our head out as fearful, we're afraid, because this is real to us. You see, so, so these kids are trained that a lot of these fears aren't real. And, uh, you know, uh, sooner or later in life, uh, some Jehovah's Witness uh, approaches the kid and they say, ah, you can't scare me with your Armageddon stuff. That's just like Halloween. You know, that's kind of what it is. So <laughs> we, we learn to confront our fears and we have to uh, if, we're, if we're, we get out of the Jehovah's Witness organization because we're, we're, we've been living in a box. So uh, let's read a little further. Uh, when, when we look at the fears that surface during Halloween, we can see that the fears do not pose a threat at the time we're expressed through the costumes and the masks. There's a psychological technique known as exposure. So we expose ourselves. So some people go on a Ferris wheel. They go on these scary rides and then the ride's over and it's all over. You know, they, they face their fears. It says, this method focuses on desensitizing people to their fears by exposing them to the source of their actual fears. So that's important as ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. We have to be exposed to the source of our actual fears. So when we get out of the box, out of the Jehovah's Witness box, I call it the golden calf sometimes, <laughs> we get out and we have to face our fears and we have to find out who's the source of these fears. And when we find out that this was just all manipulation, it was all just a, a method of keeping us in the org, because when you have people fearful, you can control them. Even governments, even, uh, I, I, I use security companies because I had one. And advertising would be scary. That's how you sold security systems, using fear. You control people. They make rash decisions. Okay, so... Halloween takes that away. It takes the fear away. Uh, you know, someone, security guy comes to your door, you're desensitized with Halloween. He says, oh yeah, yeah, scary burglar. And uh, the kid grows up and says, oh, I can be scarier than that. <laughs> you're just giving me a Halloween trick. You see, it doesn't work as well, the, the fear, you see, because we're exposed to it. So it's like a muscle. You know, we have to exercise this. That's how we grow. So Halloween uh, can be viewed as a holiday in which we mock and become insensitive to them, disguised as things we would fear if we encountered them in real life. So like ghosts and goblins and things like that. <clears throat> so in some ways, exposing ourselves to a non-existent fear object and making fun of our fears allows us to simulate fear or reenact it by pretending. And this entails enjoying the sensation of fear based on our sense of safety. 
Now, to put it another way, it is a way to play with the emotions and fears without risking any real cost. You see, in the uh, Jehovah's Witness religion, we're put under all this fear. Fear of everything that's pagan is demonized. Everything's demonized, by the way, except the wedding ring. It's pagan. It's not demonized. And the Watchtower says because there's no evilness associated with it, but it's pagan. But then I wonder, why is Christmas pagan? You know, it's the biggest birthday party in the world. Jesus was given all these gifts by the three wise men. Why is it made to be wicked? Hmm. And what about New Year's? And what about honor your father, honor your mother? Father's Day, Mother's Day. Nothing pagan there, but if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you cannot do those holidays. You see, I think part of it is this cult does not want anybody spending any money outside of itself. If you have money to spend on Halloween costumes, you better be putting it in the contribution box. And you better be afraid of the demons because that's pagan, <laughs> you see. And the kids are, all the other kids are all having fun, right? Now, <clears throat> now uh, enjoying sensational fear based on our sense of safety, uh, it's a way to play with the emotions without risking the real cost. So in, in the Watchtower, you have all this fear and you think it's real. And you see this causes all kinds of anxiety, disorders, and so on and so forth. But when we know the fear is just for a moment or we're watching a scary movie, we know it's all fake, right? Watchtower makes these movies, and they're fictional, but they make them to look real, and they tell their members that it's all from the Bible, and that it's real. And uh, so people have problems with that later on. Now, it goes on to say this article, it also makes more sense to glorify fears by incorporating them into the holiday and to create fun, therapeutic effect by being exposed to them, rather than to make them taboo. You know, like Watchtower's making them taboo, right? It says it's beneficial for us to break social boundaries and conventions for fears that have become taboo through fun activities to demonstrate that we do not take fear seriously. I think that's an important lesson, folks. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. So we don't have to wait until October 31st to have our fears teased by Halloween. We can simulate our fears and make peace with them by creating spaces for us to do so in our daily lives. Like getting out of the box, out of the watchtower box, poking your head out. Maybe this year, go to a Halloween party, dress up, get involved, face your fears. It's just for fun. Now, we can help ourselves by incorporating the therapeutic effects of Halloween into our lives. So, end of article, I, I thought there's a lot of benefits. That, that article made a lot of sense to me. Now, you're asking the question, what does the Bible say about all of this? Well, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot. doesn't say anything about Halloween, specifically. But, uh, you know, it's not going to call demons and things like that in a good way. It all calls that negative. That, that makes us fearful of the demons, the goblins, or the monsters that live under your bed. Who knows? So face those fears. Face the fears of the demons. They're, this is all a facade put on by the Watchtower. They made everything pagan wicked, except the wedding ring. You know, they wanted to keep that in there. Okay, let's move forward to the scriptures. Here's the scripture that uh, one of our other uh, XJW brethren brought out. Uh, I, I check out XJW Analyzer, Jonathan. I like what he says. He brought this out, and I, I brought the scriptures up, looked it up, and I thought, wow, that really fits the Watchtower. And the scripture is this. It's in Matthew, what is it, Matthew 23, and verse 20. 24, 25, um, well, actually 23, he says, Woe to you, and this is Jesus talking, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe the mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. <clears throat> and why do we say that? Because Watchtower has uh, kicked a lot of people out. They, they've kicked a lot of people out of the religion, and uh, that's why... Jesus is saying, woe, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, woe to you watchtower leaders, you're hypocrites, and uh, you, have, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, love, right, justice and mercy and faithfulness, 
you know, uh, countries like Norway are challenging them here and they're losing in court because of disfellowshipping young people that are baptized. And they say that's not going to go away. Remove the wicked man from amongst you. Wait a minute. It says wicked man. It doesn't say wicked child. You see, Watchtower has this all wrong. In fact, if you really wanted to follow the Bible, people did not get baptized that young. They did not. But uh, Jesus set the example. You know, he was 30-ish. So, but Watchtower is baptizing young children. And now young children can be used in Bethel in a larger way. They can be used on the service desk and things like that. Once they reach 21, they can take some extra training. Now, I did mention in one of my videos, uh, maybe that uh, they're anointing young ones at 21. Well, you see, Watchtower doesn't anoint anybody. If I'm 21 years old, <clears throat> Jeffrey Jackson gets up there and says, hey, our younger brothers are becoming anointed and getting on Bethel. And they might be in their 40s or 45 or something, the new ones, the two new guys. But, uh, and then they're anointed and they're now on the governing body. But if you're 21, you know, and you're self-righteous, you might think you should take those emblems and who's going to stop you, right? Anyways, uh, I've never seen a young person take the emblems. It's always been old folks in a wheelchair kind of a thing, but now it's changing and that's getting back to our uh, talk on the anointed. But here we have uh, the, the, the watchtower actually creating the two classes, the heavenly class and the earthly class. And when I read the Bible, we're all Jesus brothers. If you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ, you become one of his brothers and you have the heavenly hope. Uh, this whole earthly thing, um, that's going back into the Old Testament. Uh, it does not make sense. Jesus did not talk about an earthly paradise. So uh, this is a Jehovah's Witness fictional story. And they're going to grow it. And they are growing it. And uh, we're going to show it a little bit more. But what have they done? They forgot the justice, the mercy, and the faithfulness. They're disfellowshipping young children. And... Um, it's not flying in the face of certain countries. The disfellowshipping, the shunning, and, and the secret elders book. You know, how they're, how they're using that for their justice. And it's all secret, and they hold these secret courts, and they're not done properly according to Denmark. They're, they're uh, looking at this closely. And according to New Zealand, they're not apologizing for all the hidden CSA cases. And that's just one country, folks one small country. Australia opened this up, the Australia Commission, case number 29. And there's no apologies, no payouts for what the Watchtower did to all these people. So what do you guys think? Woe to you, the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, Watchtower, you hypocrites. Uh, for you tied the mint and the dill and the cum and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. So they're looking at all these little holidays, the Halloweens, the Mother's, the Father's Day, and they're picking, nitpicking at the people. But they have covered over the weightier things of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And have they been faithful? No. They have been changing and changing and changing their whole religion. This year we've been going over some of the changes and now they're not calling it new light. They're calling it changes or improvements. So they're admitting that they have been careless and reckless in how they have been managing the flock. So Jesus says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup. So they make the outside look clean. And if you cover up all the CSA, CSA inside, uh, here's what happens. Uh, it says here in the scriptures, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. And Jesus says, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of your cup and the plate, and the outside may also become clean. So, woe, he goes on, this is a really strong message. He says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, woe to you 11 governing body members, you're hypocrites, for you're like the whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful but within you are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. You see all the people that have died refusing blood transfusions and they don't have it accurate. They're not correct on it. Jesus is about life, not about death. 
They even show that in a lot of their videos. So they have that wrong. They are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. And verse 28 says, So you also outwardly appear righteous to others. And that's like this article here, right here. It, they, they look righteous. But, but what's going on? What's going on here? <laughs> he says, You also appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So when we seen what happened in the Montana court system with Brumley, their lawyer, the JW lawyer, and how they lied, and they got fined for lying and playing in the courts, we know that this religion is full of hypocrisy and full of lawlessness. So what else do we have to say? What else does the Bible say about children? Well, you don't have to look too far and you can see that the Bible says uh, that we're to be like children. Jesus says, says uh, in Matthew, he says, uh, he put the children in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself is like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So children, he used them as an example. And not just in one place, he goes on in Matthew 19, he says, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belong the kingdom of the heaven. And then in Mark, he said, uh, uh, when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. You know, they were telling, trying to scoot the children away. He said, Let the children come, come to me. Do not hinder them. And uh, it's just another account of the same thing. So obviously, this is something that happened. Uh, Jesus rebuked his disciples, said, uh, become like the children. Now, here we have the 11 men, the governing body. They have to be rebuked, become like the children. What do the children do? The children laugh and they're joyful. Well, blessed are you uh, who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Re and Thessalonians says, rejoice always. Um, Philippines, rejoice psalms you know it says fill yourselves with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy and that is not what kids do when they're when they're playing and getting ready for halloween they're getting their costumes ready i want to be superman no i want to be supergirl and uh, these are things that go on in a normal household a non-jehovah's witness household and ecclesiastes finally says bread is made for laughter wine for gladness and money answers everything now, of course, when you look up money, money is referred to as a means to an end. So it's nothing really more than that. So that's what the Bible says. It says that we should be like children. We should consume ourselves with laughter. And uh, I think what the Bible's really telling us is to be just like this family. And I'm going to pull myself off. Just like this family, you got the kids, you got three kids, four kids, and the mother, and they all look happy. They're trick-or-treating. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like the wedding ring. It's taken on a different meaning in today's age. It's, it's not pagan. It's really about uh, two people uh, uh, <clears throat> marrying and, and, and committing to one another a and a symbol of that commitment. That's really what the wedding ring shows today. So we can put aside all the pagan stuff. And Halloween today is about the kids having fun. Communities getting together. Neighborhoods getting together. They get to know each other. This is part of the love of neighbor. So, so a lot of religions do round this up to love of neighbor in a community program. Just like I have presented today. They do not uh, demonize Halloween. They do not demonize Christmas, New Year's, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Valentine's and every other holiday you can think of. That is not the case. They look at this as a time of love of neighbor, love of family, joy, laughter, and happiness. And if that's the energy that you're getting, there's not a lot of, there's, from what I'm seeing, there's no witchcraft. There's no demonism or consulting, you know, crystal balls like JW Org makes us look like. It's, it's not that. So my advice, if you're leaving the org, you're sticking your head outside of the box, it's fearful out there because in your mind, you're programmed to believe everything out there is from the devil. And uh, go to a Halloween party, um, test your fears out, find out that this is just a bunch of people having fun. Okay, well, that brings an end to the program today. And like I say, keep living your life with love. 
And that's what you'll get back. That's what you'll get out of your life. We'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.